Bible Discussions every Saturday at 10 a.m. with your host, Donald Webb and his panelists. Good morning, good morning, and good morning, Sabbath School. Amen, amen. I am so happy to be with you once more on this Sabbath School panel. We are coming to you live from the First Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Greenberg, New York, or in White Plains, um, the city of White Plains. And we, week after week, we come together to study the Sabbath School lesson. We want to say thanks to those of you who are joining us online week after week. We see your comments and we ask that you'll continue to share your questions or your comments or whatever you'd like to share with us as we do this interactive Bible study week after week. I also want to say thanks to those who continue to write and to, to encourage us and, we, and to say how much you're blessed as you study with us. It's Sabbath morning. Um, we look forward to you coming to join us here also in the sanctuary sometimes. All right, so we want to also ask you to go right ahead and uh, send a text or a, make a call to your, your neighbor, your family member, or your friend. Just let them know that we are studying God's Word. And this week is a very interesting lesson. The title of the lesson this week is Husbands and Wife Together at the Cross. And we're studying from the series of the letters, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And this week we are still continuing and we just are so grateful that you join us week after week. For those of you who are online, thank you so much. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary, we welcome you. And those of you who are visiting with us, we also welcome you you. We're going to move right ahead into our study. I'm going to ask my illustrious panel um, to introduce themselves. Let me start with Elder Kirk McDonald. Good morning, Elder, and happy Sabbath to those worshiping online as well as those who have joined us here in the sanctuary. Thank you so much. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School. This should be an interesting discussion. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Pastor Gary A. here. It is a pleasure and privilege to sit here and study with our esteemed elders here at the First White Plains Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Reginald Gary A. is a pastor for our church, and we are excited to have pastors studying with us this week again. Um, so our memory text comes to us from Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27. Our memory verse comes to us from Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. But why don't you pray with us before we begin our study? Almighty God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your gracious mercies towards us. As we study these words, Father, we pray that some hearts will be touched, some lives will be changed, some marriage or some family member, Father, will be blessed. I pray for everyone who are joining us online, those who are here in, this, in the sanctuary, we just ask wherever they are joining, loving Father, that you will be with someone today. Anoint us here at the panel as we study God, that we will speak your words only. And then when you come, we ask that you will save us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's look at the memory verse. The memory verse says, husband, love your wives, just as... Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. Now, I want us to know that as we study this lesson, Paul is using a metaphor of the wife and husband, the Christian family, Elder MacDonald. It is not so much, remember, Paul was speaking to the church. 
And here he used this metaphor, and we're going to jump right into this study. Elder, what do we make of this lesson this week? I start with you, and then pass. I jump on to you next, and Dr. Murray, please follow Pastor. Uh, the lesson this week uh, was very interesting because Paul, through Ephesians, continues to give counsel to us, counsel to us as believers as to how we should behave in all settings. And this one really focuses on our relationships. How do we behave in our relationships, one with each other, and then specifically in that relationship of marriage, um, husbands to wives, wives to husbands. And it, it really um, unpacks some texts that we sometimes cover very thinly in the Bible, and it forces us to really dig deeper into what that reciprocal relationship um, means to each other and to the union of becoming one. Sure. Uh, for me, Elder, um, I don't want us to miss the title of the lesson, Husbands and Wives Together at the Cross. And for me, the cross symbolizes two things immediately, sacrifice and healing. And so I think it's important that as we study this lesson, we remind ourselves that what Paul or the Bible is proposing here is not easy, always, for us to practically implement into our lives. It takes sacrifice. But that sacrifice does induce and bring healing to our relationships, our marriages, and our relationships um, here in the body of Christ at the church. The, the lesson that, what I really got out of this lesson is how husbands and wives are together at the cross. And throughout the marriage, husband and wife are constantly pointing their spouse to Jesus keep their eyes on Jesus, and we have some instruction here about how that happens. So God is a God of order, and uh, to create peace and harmony in our homes, and unity is a reflection of what God wants and what we will have when we reach heaven. All right, thank you so much, um, everyone. We are going to go straight into Sunday, Council to Christian Wives. Now, I know that many people, when they read this text, and this text is in two different sections of Paul's letter. It's in the Colossians. It's here, also here in Ephesians. It says, wives, submit yourself to your husband. Most folks, that's how they quote it, and that's it. But I want to Elder Kirk McDonald to let the church know and to let those of you who are studying with us online know that when Paul wrote this, the intention was not to say to the wives, please curl up when your husband speaks. We're going to go to the detail of this and we're going to share some additional information that I have gathered from, to, 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 um, from Ellen White and other sections of the Bible. Kirk McDonald, can you share with the Sabbath school um, what Paul is actually saying when he quote this text in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. I think you have to go to Ephesians 5 21 first um, and recognize that that the admonition that Paul is giving to all of us is that we should as Christians find ways to submit ourselves to each other that real love compassion comes from putting your preference, your good um, above my own and recognizing that my best relationship with you starts with me making myself smaller so that I can help lift you up. And if you start in 21 and then get to 22, you don't start with wives submitting themselves. You actually remember that this is Christian's what is your act of supplication always and how you carry yourselves? And now in the marital relationship, one half of this is how wives behave. And then the text continues later on, if you follow the paragraph, and gives a lot of admonition to husbands as to how they should behave in return. All right, thank you. So Pastor, um, the uh, very well said Kirk, I love that. When we look at the lesson, and, I, and Kurt brought this out, passes. what does it mean for the, for, for the wife to submit to their husband, as the Bible says, as is fitting, 
as is fitting in the Lord. Thank you, Elder. I think that answer, that question, the answer to that question comes from the context, as uh, Elder McDonald alluded to. I think, well, I know Paul presupposes that he is speaking to a couple where the husband has already submitted himself to Christ. Amen. Paul is very clear as to who he's speaking to in all of his books. There are books where he's speaking to new converts. There are times when he is addressing people who are not yet converting, converted. Here, Paul presupposes, and he also assumes that he is talking to a couple where the man has submitted himself to Christ, he is following Jesus, he is a Christian, and so the woman is submitting to a man who is following God. I think that is very important. Amen, thank you. Dr. Murray, are you ready? So, yes, it's a, it's a very interesting text. So Paul is speaking to wives, but he's speaking to the church because the wife is the bride, the church, and you know, we are asked to submit ourselves to Christ, it's hard for humans to submit to anything, especially in today's world where nobody wants to have a boss and there's a lack of appreciation for hierarchy and order. But um, he is speaking to wives and counseling wives about their role in the relationship. And really, as I read through, I don't know where it is here, but the wife is the person who keeps that relationship grounded no matter what happens. Uh, she submits, she respects her husband, she respects the relationship, but above all, she respects Christ and knows what her role is in serving Christ. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. So, church, and if you have comments, please stand at the mic, and we are seeing Elder Perry. Go ahead, please, sir. Yeah, I'm going to be here for a while. I'm, I'm going to sit down here because I have questions after questions. Okay, in the memory text, it says, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. But it never say it never say wife loves your husband. So how do a wife love her husband? Brother Perry, you you're looking to start trouble for the for, 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 for many of the, 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 the members of this panel. I will say that the text actually speaks to a reciprocal relationship. Reciprocity is my behavior causes your behavior, your behavior causes my behavior. Um, and I think the use of the word submit is an act of love. The act of submission, when I decide, Brother Perry, that you are more important than me, I've already given something. I've sacrificed my needs to honor your needs. That is the greatest act of love because that's how Jesus sacrificed his life for our lives. So that is an act of love. And husbands, in turn, love your wives the when we get into the further into the lesson we're going to get that story of how christ loves the church and puts energy into loving the church not for what it is and how it treats him but for what he wants it to be to correct in it the things that are broken that is a greater love than we've ever understood because we think that love is about sister delta murray me loving you for beautiful hair and the way you dress that's the stuff I can see. The real love that Christ is showing us is loving you for the things you're not yet. And that's what this lesson continues to show us as we get deeper into it. Quick piggyback. So um, the man submitting also, because you say, um, rep represent, I, 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 I time talks when I, when I say that word. But so the man submitting also, what you're trying to say, is an is a act of showing his love as a wife, is submitting also showing their love. The act of sacrifice, even I would go further. If you go back to the, to the, uh, I'm sorry. The, if you go back to the text, um, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself to her. That sacrifice. So love my wife, but give myself, sacrifice myself, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That's an act of sacrifice because I can't show up as me to be a good husband. And thank you so much, Kirk. Um, before I go on to your pastor, Brother Perry, I just want you to understand too, um, my dear elder, that when the lesson says, husband loves your wife, 
Just as, we don't miss this part, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Paul is taking here that you as the husband, me as the husband, have already submitted ourselves to God. You got to bear in mind, Elder Perry, that you are not the head of the house because you are the head of the house. You are the head of the house because God is the head and you allow God to be your head. You cannot, and Ellen White said in a quotation that I spent all day looking for yesterday, but I just couldn't come up. She says that the men who have not yet submitted to God should not even use the word submit in the house to tell a wife to submit. I also want to share with you, Elder Perry, that God never gave the command for any woman to submit to men generally. He says to your own husband. So when men get it in their head that you are the weaker vessel, you must submit to me. It is wrong, church. The Bible never commands a general submission of women into men, unto men in society. So this order is commanded only in the sphere of the home and the church. And God has not commanded in his word that men have exclusive authority, be it in the area of politics, of business, education, or so on. No, he was talking only about the home and the church. So when we as men submit ourselves to God, and God expect, God would expect us then, and our wife and children will expect that they will obey and they will not necessarily obey but they will follow our leading but if god is not leading us we can lead the church we can lead the home so the man is setting the tone for the marriage yes he's setting yes. the culture yes. for the yes. marriage because he have already submitted to god amen amen yeah, yeah yeah and that is the piece that i think is really important God is setting the tone for the marriage, and the man in his role is following God. And the quote you're looking for is captured in Ellen White, um, and it says, um, if, is, uh, if the husband is a coarse, rough, boisterous, yes, egotistical, yes, yes, harsh, yes. and overbearing man, yes, yes. let him never utter the yes. word yes. that the husband is the head of the wife. All right, you and were just sharing that. I want you to yes. share this quote to the Sabbath school. Right, yes. yeah, to the Sabbath school. Um, and that she must submit to him in everything, for he is not the Lord. He is not the husband in the true significance of the term. And if he's not the husband, then there's no followership. So I want us to remember this too. Leadership is followership. Best leaders actually follow the constituents they've been given to lead. They carry them to where they should be. This case, for the man to be the leader, he is following Christ. Mm -hmm. And as he follows Christ, he is then the representation of Christ's tone. And the wife and family can then follow that because all he is is representing the tone set. By and in God. that case, no, Brother Perry, you don't have to tell your wife to love you. Right. You understand? There was a man who continued to say in the house, I am the man of this house, I am the man of this house. But what we have to understand, gentlemen, that if we are the true man um, in the house, we don't have to tell our family. Yeah. They will know and they will see it. So let us, by God's grace, allow God to lead us and then the family will lead us and the wife will understand that she will love you and respect. We don't talk about submission or so, to submit yourself to your own husband. And let's not get it wrong, gentlemen. It does not mean that they are to curl up when we speak. The submission here we're talking about is a level of respect, the same that you have for God, the wife will have it for you. Remember also, there can't be two heads. God is the head of the church. You are the head of the house. So when it says submission, it just means a subhead. You understand me, Elaper? It just means a subhead, but it doesn't mean that it's a lower head. And we as men must get that. Thank you. Sure, a couple of things. Um, to demonstrate the cyclical uh, nature of this principle, a woman should could and would follow or submit to a woman after she herself has submitted to God because she has to have a relationship with Christ mm -hmm. in order to make a determination that this man who I'm choosing 
is a man to whom I can submit. That's right. And so what, what, what precedes the woman submitting to her husband is her having a relationship with God in the context where a woman can right. choose a man. That's right. We know there are places that's in the world where arranged marriages happen. I'm not talking about that. But where you have a decision as to who you decide to date, who you decide to marry, your submission to God is, works hand in hand to you being able to submit to someone who will love you, who will. And, and, to, and to also um, illustrate the depth of this principle, if I, if I may, Ella, just another minute. Um, uh, I learned this from a parishioner. A woman came to me, uh, she's married, and she said, Pastor, I learned, I'm learning that submission is not only when I agree with my husband, but when I disagree with him. That's true submission. That's true submission. And I, and I, I sat back and I thought about it. I said, what? You know, this principle, if misused and abused, could be dangerous. To submit your will to someone who you don't agree with, but to trust that he has, number one, your best intentions in mind, and number two, is connected to Christ, is a, is a very deep principle uh, that uh, we, are to, we all have a role to play in, um, uh, particularly uh, the woman, not, not only, not, sig not singularly, but particularly the woman who prays and has a relationship with God and gets to choose, yes, I can submit to this person. Amen to that. that. That's a good point because to submit doesn't mean you're saying yes, yes, yes all the time. It is you, your allegiance is to Christ first and foremost. And there are times when there will be disagreements uh, because your husband, as a wife, your husband may be making a decision that is not in the best interest of following Christ or the best interest of the family. And as a wife, our job is not just to say yes, yes, yes. We are to be unified in the best outcome for the family as we walk with Christ. And I want to yes. actually point out just what uh, Dr. Geary and Elder Murray have just pointed out. That behavior is one of the strongest behaviors we can exhibit as humans and mortals on this earth, which is to actually submit when we don't agree. Because yeah. th the kind of self-confidence requires to actually trust the process, <laughs> trust the relationship, trust God's plan is an act of strength. Um, and we talk, you know, the language is the weaker sex. This is an act of, of demonstrating the strength of character it requires to do that. Thank you so much. And again, I just want to encourage those of you who are in the congregation, you can feel free to stand at the mic and we would love to hear from you. Um, we have a number of folks interacting here on the chat. We want to say good morning to Charmaine Walker, um, Carolyn Jenkins, and I guess that this is M.S. Peer. I kind of figure who this name is, um, uh, but I like the interaction that are coming um, here, that's a great point, Ella. Thanks for clarifying the point of submission. Um, I was on a Bible study last night, and the presenter shared these great points. Submission is a yielding done out of love. It is not coerced, and the husband is to be a representative of Christ. And we also see also a woman has, um, who hasn't submitted to Christ can't submit to her husband, and that is so true. Um, when the men do their part in the home, it is pretty easy to for the rest of the family. We, got, we, we played a game that's called follow the leader, follow the leader, leader, leader. You know that one. And gentlemen, we learn that if we are not leading and allowing God to lead us, the family goes into a different direction. And that's not God's desire or will. So we're going to move on to the church and the bride of Christ. Dr. Murray, can you share with the Sabbath school, how does Christ, the bridegroom, prepare this bride, the church? Christ refers to us as his bride, um, and he loves us. And I love going back to Ezekiel 16. It's mentioned in this uh, Monday's lesson, and it talks about Christ looking upon the children of Israel. They were dirty, they were covered in blood, they had nothing, and he pitied them. And he took them in, he cleaned them, he washed them, he put uh, jewelry on them, he made them beautiful so that they sparkled and they were envied by all the nations around. And so he prepared them to do his work. 
but then how they disappointed him because they took all that gift and they turned it in and did evil. So as we flip over to Ephesians, the church as the bride of Christ, we are his bride and he loves us as his bride. We must never forget that. And he gave himself as the gift, right, as the dowry, as whatever it was, gave himself as the gift so that he could prepare us to accept him. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray. That's um, a great way of starting out here as we look at the church as the bride of Christ, part one. Kirk, there is a parable in Matthew 25 where um, Jesus shared about the five wise virgin and the five foolish virgin. It's, it, it's kind of pointing us to how we are actually prepared. Can you bring the Sabbath school through that just to show us how Christ actually loved the church? Yeah, and again, um, I like where uh, Dr. Murray went. This reference back to Ezekiel and then back again to, um, to Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, if you want to follow along, um, and then um, 29. This preparation and the preparation for the wedding ceremony is one where in the in the tradition of the time the bride's preparation was done by her handmaids um, the cleansing of her body how she got dressed was all the things that were done for her to be ready in a state of readiness for the groom's arrival this depiction in Ephesians has Christ doing that work and Christ taking the care of preparing her, just as in Ezekiel, yeah. going through all of the steps of making sure that her readiness was perfect so that he could give her to himself. That's love. That's a lesson for husbands. If husbands haven't learned what their role is, take it out of this text. Which, how far do you go to see beyond what is there to see what could be and then put the energy in edifying, uplifting, elevating her to this state of perfection just for you? What a love God has for us. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, this, this Sabbath school lesson um, for this day also points us to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and in our relationship with Christ. Say the wise virgin in the parable um, alerts us to the need to have oil. Very important. The oil here symbolizes what? The Holy Spirit in our lambs as we wait for the bridegroom, Dr. Murray, to come and take us to the altar. And all of us, we love that idea. When we stand at the altar, we, uh, we, we, we love that moment, you know, and we look forward to that moment when it will be real, you know. So we want to move on to part two, um, the church as the bride of Christ, part two. Pastor, as Paul described the marriage ceremony, we are reminded of Christ's relationship to the church. Can you talk to the Sabbath school a little bit about Christ's relationship to the church. Sure. Uh, we talked a little bit about Christ being the head of the church um, and the church submitting itself to the headship of Christ. I want to go back to the illustration that Elder McDonald uh, sort of uh, introduced us to with the uh, bridegroom himself preparing the bride as opposed to uh, the bridesmaids, as we see in Matthew 25. Um, the key to me there is that the groom or Christ makes his commitment to the relationship before the bride is adorned, mm -hmm. before she is made ready, before she is cleansed, before she takes that you know uh, uh, near eastern ancient near eastern bath that the bridesmaids would do. The groom makes his commitment. This is the person I want to be with. This is the person I want to marry. And I think it's important for us to note that Christ makes his commitment to us. 
He makes his commitment to the relationship, his relationship to the church before the church is ready, before the church is perfect, before the church is cleansed, before the church is where it needs to be, while the church is acting up, while the pastor does not have it right, while the elders are still learning, while the members are acting up, Jesus has made his commitment to us. I think that is an important principle for us to start this, this discussion of uh, Jesus and his relationship to the church with. Thank you, Pastor. So, Kirk, from a biblical standpoint, you know, uh, your description of a happy marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the description of a happy marriage starts um, right where, where Dr. Garrier just left us. The commitment is made not on how you will look at the end. The commitment is not made on the things I can see on the outside. The commitment is made because I love you for what you are yet not. Yes. I love you for what you have still to become. That's what, that's the lesson for us. By the way, we keep, the, the lesson focuses on marriage, but remember this lesson also started just in relationships. My one-to-one -one relationship with you, Elder Webb, is not for how you always behave, but it's for my conviction that we are going to be great friends one day, yeah. and I submit myself into that relationship with you and wait for you to actually give, give it back. And if it never comes, I'm still good because I've done what I would have, should have done. I have sacrificed myself in that investment. This is the relationship, and if you want a happy relationship, with your spouse, with your parent, with your child, with your friend. This is what Paul is giving us advice to. Totally give of yourself into that relationship. Before you see it give back to you, before you see the beauty on the wedding day, totally give yourself over to it. Brother Perry, <laughs> love that. <laughs> Brother Perry. Okay. Um, you know, in the lesson, we, we, we see that, okay, um, in, in time past that there was a, um, a best man that would kind of give out the, the bride or the father would give the bride to the, to the bridegroom. But we see that Christ himself is preparing this. He himself is doing all he's doing, the preparing and himself is accepting and himself is doing the giving. You know, let me go back to the husband and wife situation. Um, the submission and the, the loving. You know, for a husband and wife to be, like, to be together or have a good relationship, they have to pray together. They have to communicate with each other on a, on, on a daily basis or all the time. But whether you're wrong or right, it's, it's a communication system. It's just as Christ and the church. For us to be with Christ or be, um, be the bride of Christ and be the, 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 the church that Christ wants to be, we just have to have a communication with him, praying, um, talking to him every day and having fellowship with each other. That's... That's where um, the body of Christ is, um, is uh, the bride. So Christ's bride has to communicate with him every day. We have to pray. We have to um, have that, that, that fellowship with him every day so, we can, so he can present us as his bride. And it, I don't know if you understand. But yeah, I got you. I got you. And I um, just want to share with you, Ella, there's someone who commented online that also a woman who hasn't submitted to Christ can't submit to her husband. So it's a relationship, but it has to be led based on the relationship that the man who is the head of the home has with God who is the head, uh, who is his head, all right? So when the husband is led, uh, allowing God to lead him, it's not difficult for the rest of the family, especially the wife, to extend that love, that submission, and that respect to you. I, I just want to say that the you ask a question about what is a perfect marriage or something like that. Um, <laughs> no, I was thinking about what is Kirk's description of a of happy, a happy uh, hopeful marriage. relationship, yes. marriage relationship. I think the optimal marriage or relationship is one where Christ is at the center of the family, the head of the home, the, the uh, husband and the wife together. But we do have marriages where not each one is a believer, right? We have um, unequally yoked marriages. And it is important that if one finds themselves in that situation, they don't fret. Because 
our role as a spouse, in this case a wife, is to continually keep Christ foremost in mind because Christ is preparing his church. And so a wife can have a great influence over a husband in those situations. And again, there's ultimate sacrifice um, to give up oneself and to always try to walk according to how Christ would um, have walked. So, you know, God, Christ, I go back to Ezekiel. Uh, God looked upon these people who were filthy, who were dirty, who didn't know, and he pitied them. And he took them in, and he cleaned them up, and he loved them, and all he wanted was for them to follow in return. So if you find yourself in a marriage where you are not equally yoked, don't fret. Just do what Christ has asked you to do, and it can have a great influence on your husband and on your marriage. So I kind of like the direction this take, Pastor, because um, so far I haven't heard Dr. Murray R. Um, R. Kirk telling us that what they see as a perfect marriage is when the husband and wife come together to church and they sit beside each other and they wear the same color suit. <laughs> why we, we leave that out, Kirk? I didn't say that. <laughs> no, why we leave that out? Listen, because that's uh, what we, uh, that is our impression of Yeah, but because again, we look on the outside, but God looks on the inside. And what Paul is admonishing us about here is about behavior. I'll even go as far as this, because um, uh, I always like getting in a little bit of trouble on these panels. Um, we often as believers describe unequally yoked based on your profession of faith or whether you're Adventist or Baptist. I would argue that that's not what Paul is saying. This is about whether or not you all have a North Star, you have a navigation tool called Christ-centeredness, called learning to be more like him every day. So regardless of where you are in your journey to profess your faith to one denomination or another, you can be right here sitting on the pew, elder, and be unequally yoked with your wife who is is head of, head of the education department. So let us be careful that where you've declared your denomination is not the behavior here. And the, the, the good marriage, the healthy marriage, has learned to give to each other, sacrificing not even of self, but sacrificing for self. I want to get to that because when we become one, I'm not sacrificing me versus you. I'm sacrificing for me one. That's the relationship God wants with us. May I? So I, I like what you said about being equally yoked. It is beyond a domination, denominational um, setting. But the other thing is that when wives and husbands are married, uh, you said something earlier about Christ sees what we can become. And so in a marriage, we see what that spouse can become. And as Christ prepares and adorns the church, He's not looking at me right now, I'm sinful. I'm, he knows what I can become, and that is what he is preparing for. Amen, Dr. Sure, uh, which is why, again, I really love the title of this lesson, Together at the Cross, because at that cross, there were individuals who were convicted. There were individuals who were not convicted until moments later, the centurion, who then declared that he truly, this was the son of God. There was a dying thief on one side of Jesus who believed there. There was another one who never believed. And so at the cross, we have a spectrum of individuals with whom we have to be patient. Jesus sacrificed himself for each and every one of them, the dying thief who believed and the one who never believed. And so within our relationships, whether it be marital, whether it be interpersonal relationships here at the church, uh, we are at the cross. And we need to uh, understand and make a commitment to love one another, uh, irrespective of where that person may be in his or her walk with Christ or beyond that, um, um, you know, what we perceive to be their personality um, uh, flaws or what have you may be. Thank you so much. And then I also, again, want to recognize those who are studying with us online. We have a very healthy and active um, audience online. 
um, Joy, Stanley, we see Natalie, Thomas, we see the Kinetic Connection. Um, we thank you so much for your comments and for studying with us. Again, those of you who are here in the sanctuary, you have any questions, please feel free to ask your questions. We are going to move quickly into Wednesday. Um, love your wife as you do yourself. Now, if you look at in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Dr. Murray, I'm going to skip you on this one for the time being and jump over to Kirk. Paul gave an interesting and I would say an appropriate advice. First of all, we, um, he says that since husbands and wife are considered one flesh elder, as the husband, you're, you have a responsibility to take care of your body, which is a dwelling place, just like the pastor and the elders have a responsibility to take care of the sanctuary, the temple of God. Now, what does it mean, Elder MacDonald, when the lesson points us from to Ephesians 5, loving yourself as you, loving your wife as you do yourself. While you think about that, could you, I crave your indulgence just to take someone who's standing at the mic. Thank you so much. Sister Clark. Thank you, Elder Webb. Good morning, Sabbath School. Well, if my husband don't love himself, hmm. How is he going to love me? I know this is not talking about outside relationship of Christ. He's to love Christ just, he's to love his wife just as how he loved Christ. Please explain that to me if every day he get up and said, oh, I hate myself, I do this, I do that. So explain that to me, please. That's a very good question, and that ties in with what Elder Kirk is going to answer. But before you go on, Sister Clark, what your husband's name is? Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think it is, uh, it is an important thing to understand. I'm going to take us to Ephesians 5, 28 to 30. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and his bones. And all this is telling us is, it is, even when you don't like yourself, it is, it is a pathway to something that is very sad for that individual. We live in a time where mental health stress affects people and we have suicide and, and so many horrible things happen as a result of self-hatred. If you're not in a good place with yourself, back to what Dr. Murray mentioned before, that's not the time to be in any relationship um, because you actually want the relationship for fixing yourself and that healing of yourself requires other work done first. But if you truly understand what it means to to accept yourself and love yourself, then you can't hurt yourself. And that's what the text calls for. That's what the relationships call for. It, when I can love you, Sister Phillips, when I can love you, Sister Tomlinson, the way I love myself, I can't hurt you. I can't be mad at you in board meeting. I cannot say bad things about you when you're not in the room. I can't go find Elder De Brother Desir and, and Sister Thomas and say, Sister Tomlinson is bad because I would be hurting myself in that relationship. This is the admonition to husbands and wives. When have you been in a conversation where you said, you know, my wife is, if you're not edifying her, you're not being the husband. And wives, when you're in a conversation to go, man, he, are you edifying that person? That's what it's called for. And that edification is what you would say about yourself. That's why I said the sacrifice isn't sacrificing me for you. It's sacrificing me for us being one. When I regard us as one, I depress the things in me that would hurt the better version of me when I'm with you. Uh, Sister Clark. Are you satisfied with that or you want to expand a little more? I'm you, okay, very good. We just want to make sure that your question is, is answered. And um, next week we see you and your husband walking in. Dr. Murray, you had a comment? Uh, 
No, I, I think uh, Elder Kirk hit the nail on the head that, you know, it is about the two-way street. Amen, amen. And, and Pastor, I'm pretty sure you may want to share the last comment on Wednesday. Love your wife as you do yourself. Amen. Um, and, and to, uh, I think to answer Sister uh, Clark's answer question rather directly, um, and Elder McDonald alluded to this, the answer is he cannot. Yeah, uh, uh, right. a, a man who doesn't love himself uh, cannot love anyone else, yet alone um, his, his wife. And um, I think that's why when God created Adam, and spirit of prophecy goes into this more, Ellen White does, the, the command to be a good steward over the earth was first given to Adam. Before he created Eve, he gave Adam an identity, a job, a J-O-B, amen. amen. Before he got a wife, he, got, he had a job. And, 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 and so, and those responsibilities gave him a sense of self something. If, if, he, if, if he didn't have that, that love for himself, that identity, that, that sense of purpose, um, he would not have been able to love his wife appropriately. And so um, I guess the moral of the story is it's important, men, to get a job. <laughs> before, Absolutely, before because you if do. you can't care for yourself, who are you going to take care of your wife and family is going to come right after that? Dr. Murray? So it's very interesting that the uh, text for this week talks about um, or the whole concept of the study is for men to love themselves. You said something. Christ, you know, when he made Adam, he gave him a job. Adam had power and control. Yeah. But now this is saying love your wife. That's yeah. not something that's innate to people who have a lot of power and control, yeah. right? And then telling wives to submit, I have to admit, I don't like that word submit, but it's an important word because it means reverence, respect, many, many things. We misinterpret that word sometimes. That's right. And that's difficult for women. So men love, women submit. These are areas that Paul knew what was hard in a relationship. And it is our relationship with Christ where we exhibit those things love for Christ, submission to Christ. Amen. So Thank Dr. You. Murray, I love that. And I love the fact that you pointed out how difficult this word submit is for, for us. Yeah. Um, regardless of who we are, saying that I'm submitting to you feels like a hard thing to carry. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough though, the world has perverted our use of the word love. Mm -hmm. Because if you listen to love in the context of what love is, that Christ's love was a love that said, I am sacrificing for you. Amen. What is a greater act of submission than sacrificing life for you? But we so easily go, Sister Clark, I love your hat. We are easy to play with the word love and not recognize the power in the word love and that to love is already an act of submission. To truly love already means not that I have power and control, but that I have purpose. And the purpose that Adam was given, Dr. Garrier, the purpose of protecting and taking care of the, 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 the world. When he got his wife, the purpose was ahead of everything else for him. That's <laughs> Elder Webb, we're going to have you take that one. You know, um, yeah. I will repeat the question for those online. Yes, Sister say. Clark uh, is asking, again, to the Sabbath school, and Elder Webb will help us with the answer, if it was it Adam's commitment and love already for Eve when he saw her, when he was faced with the choice, the apple or Eve, he chose Eve. 
Um, thank you so much, Eller. I, and I know that um, the pastor, Sister Clark, I don't know if we talked about this yesterday, the very question I was going to throw that on pastor. But I, did, I know we are out of time because I really want to talk about the one flat. But um, that's a very great question. And most folks are saying, it just reminds you of the kind of love that we have for each other, Sister Clark. You know, and God, we are not saying that the man should follow the wife or the wife should follow the husband or submit Dr. Murray to the husband into wrong Kirk. But at the same time, we are to be so willing that we are prepared if it means to sacrifice together. But the Perry, make your comment yeah. short because I, I cannot. I can, it, I can make it really quick and we press for time. But yes. that the same point that Sister Clark make about um, Adam eating the fruit, I was thinking the same, same thing about Ananias and Sapphira. Yes. You know, a husband and wife, they, 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 they was together but in the wrong, in the wrong mentality. But the whole thing, according to the, 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 um, the lesson today, is submitting to Christ's way. It's Christ, Christ is to be the center of everything. Not because somebody, um, we, we submit to each other, we are, we are to lead into doing the wrong thing because we are together, but, but Christ is supposed to be the center of our good, decision. Good, good, good point, um, Brother Perry. And we got to remember that if you're looking at all the instances in the, in the Bible, Ananias and Sapphira, we talk about Abraham and his wife, Sarah. We talk about um, um, Adam and Eve. We have a, 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 a responsibility as men to stand up when it's time to stand up and to allow God to constantly be our head. I can't move on, Dr. Murray, unless I, we, we touch a little on Thursday. I'm going to ask each one of us to um, use this as our final comment. Kirk, I'm going to leave it with, leave, 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 go with Pastor. Pastor, we notice here that modern cultures, I, had, I wrote this question because I, I wanted to get this out there. Modern cultures, even more historical ones, have exploited the sexual relationship, leaving men and women in very unequally roles, usually with the male excessive dominant. But what I'm saying, Pastor, the Bible says, we're moving from Paul now, we're going to God himself. Genesis 2 verse 24 it says, when he says they are joined together and become one flesh. Can you share with us a little what was God's original plan? Because certainly modern culture has distorted that. Sure. Um, the one flesh principle certainly alludes to uh, a husband and wife's sexual unity. Uh, with one another. Uh, but it also, I think, speaks to their spiritual unity. Um, in many instances, their emotional unity and their uh, uh, intellectual unity, which is why the Bible tells us that we ought to be careful not to be unequally yoked. The submission, the submission principle, ideally, um, as my parishioner who told me, I learned that submission is when I don't agree. It's not necessarily when he convinces me, yeah. but it's when I don't agree and I still submit. That principle should be applied, uh, should be necessary as, as little as possible. Why? Because when two people are one, more often than not, they will agree. More often than not, they will see things um, um, in the same vein. Uh, when they serve the same God, they have the same values, they have the same, they communicate with one another um, before they enter into the relationship and while they are into the, in, in the relationship, there, there's a certain harmony, there's a certain oneness uh, that's there. Not always, which is why submission is there, uh, but uh, hopefully um, as relationships grow, couples become uh, more and more like-minded they say that married couples they begin to look like one another yes even yes. after some time yes um and so uh that oneness is something we look to uh, continuously progress in in our relationships thank you pastor in the interest of time dr murray what does this one flesh concept mean to you dr murray as you consider your own marriage relationship so there have been experiments done of grafting skin, dark skin onto light skin, light skin onto dark skin. And what you see when the skin is grafted is that the grafted skin begins to change more toward the color of the person it's grafted onto. So if it's dark skin grafted onto white skin, the skin, the graft lightens, vice versa, the graft darkens, right? 
So one flesh, I, I agree with pastor, people begin to think alike, but in this vein, what Paul admonishes us is that we should, our relationship, our marriage should reflect our unity in Christ because people can be married and be unified in doing the wrong things, right? Yeah. But this is different. He's talking specifically to believers, specifically about how our unity should be perceived by the world and what should be at the core of our relationships. Thank you. And that's your final thought, Dr. Murray. Thank you so much. Kirk, could you bring this home for us, please? Well, um, I just think the lesson is, is powerfully um, summed up probably in, um, in, in, in the fact that you go all the way back to Genesis, and this is one of my favorite texts, Genesis 2, 23, and Adam said, because what has happened is uh, God has allowed him to take, fall asleep, and he's taken a rib, and he's created a woman, and Adam's response is, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh because she was taken out of me that means oneness yes. then i can't hurt me yes. i can't yell at me i can't abuse me i am already subjected to me i've sacrificed for me to exist because me is the oneness that we are being promised. And that one flesh, that oneness, is the relationship Christ has with us. We are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. We are with him in that ideal state. And as Elder Murray said earlier, the love he has for us is the love for who we will be when we submit ourselves to that relationship. And husbands, the love we have for our wives is for who she is when we have edified her and love her. And wives, the love you have for your husband is knowing that he is following Christ's plan and you are one with him. Amen. Thank you so much. I want to also use the opportunity at this time as we wrap up our divine uh, our sabbath school lesson here to welcome those of you who are in the sanctuary i um i i especially want to recognize um um a couple who i saw sitting in the congregation from early this morning um i think the name is uh, rota and davian alley we want to say welcome to you on behalf of our church pastor and our elders and officers. We say thank you. Any other visitors in the house? Could you stand quickly, please? If you're a visitor, could you stand, please? Thank you so much. Your name is? The last name? Philip. Okay. Welcome to you. And uh, your wife? Thank you so much. You're from Antigua? All right, welcome to our church here at First White Plains. We pray that today it will not only be just a worship service, but it will be an experience for you and you'll come again. To everyone else, may God bless you as we continue to worship. I want to close by letting you know, folks, that when we enter into a Christ-like relationship, when Christ comes into our heart, this results in permanent, loving, caring relationship, not only for the church, but for each other. May God bless you today as we continue to worship and as we study with him week after week. Divine service with Pastor, with Dr. Reginald Guerrier and Pastor Trevor Barnes begin right now.
and there will be someone in there uh, waiting to pray with you. Uh, Bible class this afternoon is canceled and will resume on next Sabbath, September 9th. Senior choir rehearsal uh, will be today between 4 and 6 p.m. in preparation for Seniors Day on September 23rd. Please come out and support our seniors. And you don't have to be a senior to join the choir. Young and old, we welcome you all to support our seniors on Seniors Day. AYM will be, um, they will also meet, the AYM um, group will meet this afternoon at 6 p.m. And uh, cleanup day that was scheduled for September 10th has been canceled. There'll be, however, a dumpster available for departments to utilize. Sabbath School Rally Day will take place on September 9th, that's next Sabbath, uh, with our guest speaker, Pastor Easton Marks, and will begin at 9.30 a.m. sharp. Uh, for our other upcoming um, announcements in October, we have Community Service Day in October, mm -hmm. and we have Communion Day coming up, and Adventures and Pathfinders Day. Uh, today, as you prepare your hearts to, for Divine Hour, know that God is in his holy temple. Will all the earth be silent? Have a blessed Sabbath. This is the children's hour. Thank you for coming. Well, our story today is entitled, Peace Be With You. And the Bible text that goes with it said, May the Lord watch over you and give you peace. Number 626. With this story, we have quite a, three imaginations. Number one. Imagine that life in your family is perfectly peaceful. Imagine that the family rules are totally fair. Your parents agree that the rules are fair. And your brothers and sisters never argue. You must, and everyone wants to obey every rule. No one ever gets into trouble. Imagine that everyone in your family always gets along. No one ever argues, no, one's, no, one's, no feelings is ever hurt. Everyone works together, helping each other, encouraging each other, listening carefully. Well, this is another imagination. Some of you may already have all of these things. But for those who do not have these things, imagine that you have them. Imagine that there is always plenty of good food to eat and clothes that fit and are always clean. You have all the books you can read, a piano and a computer, and nice furniture. And why not? A pool in the backyard. Can you imagine? It would be perfect. Before our world was created, there was perfect peace in heaven. God's family worked together in peace. The rules were fair. The angels knew the rules would bring peace and make them happy. They loved God. They wanted to obey his rules. Some people think that peace means there isn't any war. Peace is more than just that. In the Bible, peace is not just the absence of fighting. 
It is the fullness of living. In the Bible, peace means having everything you need to be happy. Some people think that peace is boring, hmm. or that heaven will be boring. Now you know that is not. It won't be boring. Peace doesn't just mean that no one will ever argue with you. It's not just emptiness. It means that someone will love you. Peace is fullness. So today, again, the memory verse said, may the Lord watch over you and give you peace. So we like to pray that we will continue to love God and pray that he will continue to give us peace no matter what. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for this day again. Thank you for bringing us all here safe. We pray that you'll continue to dwell with us so that on that great day when you shall return, we will be in peace and join you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath, everyone. We now invite the congregation to stand for our call to worship this morning. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Father God, come into this place. Come into our hearts that we would be changed, yea, we would be saved. In the name of Jesus, amen.
and can it be 198 and can it be amazing love how can it be
at this time we are going to come before his throne to give him thanks because he has done so much for us as I look at your faces your life has been spared you uh, look beautifully dressed <laughs> so there are blessings that God has given to us and even whatever is giving us an issue he has promised to be there for us and to go through it with us so at this time I'm going to invite everyone or as many as would like to come before the throne as we petition our God for the wonderful things that he's done for us. surround you and say holy 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 because that is who you are but Lord you look down through the portals of time and realize that the creatures that you created for your glory would fall we would become entrapped in sin but because of your love you sent your son to pay the penalty for our transgression die on a cruel cross, shed his precious blood as a remission for our sin. Rise again to give us glory and victory. For that we are eternally grateful to you. We cannot fully understand or comprehend this love because it is not for our finite minds. But God, because of your mercy, because of your grace, because of that image of the altars over the, the, the seat of mercy, dear God, we can approach you. We can come today, dear Lord, to say, forgive us first of all for where we have wronged and erred, when we were not patient, when we were not kind, when we were not loving, above all, when we were not forgiving, because you, O oh God, have forgiven us. Dear Father, we thank you for this grace and this mercy. Oh, dear Father, today as we are assembled here before you, our hearts are open. For some, it is aching, dear God. They have concerns of the cares of this life, whether it is financial, whether it is housing, whether it is employment. Therefore, I let them know that they can trust in you because you said that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Teach us this faith, dear God. Dear Father, there are those who are afflicted with illnesses. It was never your design for humanity to even have sickness and even death. But dear God, once again, because of that victory, rising with healing in your wings, dear Lord, we have the confidence in you that if we come to you and ask according to your will, you will grant it. Dear Father, we thank you for even the blessings that we see today. Our dear Elder Phillips is here amongst us, and we give you thanks for that. And for all the others, dear Lord, who can recount what God has brought them through 
and to the place where he has put their feet, dear God. We say thank you and hallelujah. Oh, dear Father, we know that your coming is soon and that the world is enshrouded in darkness. People's minds are disturbed and confused. The world tells them that things that are wrong are right, that they have no reconciliation, they have no, no need to be afraid or fearful of the things that they do. So dear God, we're asking us that today, as your children, that we will be salt and light to the earth. We will shine your love into this dark world. And the life that we live that is infused with your Holy Spirit will teach them and guide them. Be with the speaker of this hour. Dear Lord, we ask that you put a special blessing and anointing upon him. May the words that he speak be the words that you have given to him. Hide him behind the shadow of the cross. And dear Father, as we leave this place, it is not that we just had a beautiful time with the singing and the praise and the speaking of the word, but dear Lord, open our hearts, transform our minds, give us a brand new attitude to spread your gospel to this dying and lost world because that is the mission that you have given us to do. Dear Lord, what I fail to ask, I ask that you take these simple words, transform it into the language of heaven, that it may be a sweet incense to you. This we ask in no other name, but the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake, saints of God, say, Amen. say amen again the spirit of god is certainly in this place today happy sabbath everyone oh i said happy sabbath everyone isn't it good to be in the house of god we want to welcome some special visitors who are in the house with us today we'd like to welcome the eastwood family from london england amen, amen. steve carla kyran or Kieran, Tyrell, Kavali, and Israel. Where are you? Just wave your hands where you are. Amen, amen. As a matter of fact, would you please send a representative from your family here? We have a gift for you. We want, to, want you to send a representative of somebody who is bold. Uh, uh, there she is. Someone from London, England is bold. She's coming up here. Because she came up here, church, why don't we give her something, amen? Here is something we'd like for you to take home with you. Uh, may the Lord bless you and when you come to New York again because we know you will come again the to you the second greatest city in the world uh, we want to let oh, wow. you know that you have a family here at White Plains and may God richly richly bless you amen 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 uh, apparently someone someone has lost a phone is okay um, before we move to the next item, I want to remind or rather uh, let the church know that the pastor visiting with us today, he is, uh, he hails from California, but he also comes from Missouri where he pastors. Amen. He is a pastor at the Central States Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and he is here with us not only today, but also this afternoon. Uh, now, we do have a gift for the pastor later on, but our head treasurer uh, wants to welcome the pastor. 
And so, Pastor Barnes, would you please come forward before we introduce you? Uh, we would like to thank you for being here. And Sister Housen here, the head treasurer, wants to thank you for being here during our stewardship Sabbath here at White Plains. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Yes, it's my pleasure to welcome Pastor Barnes on behalf of the pastor and all members of the church, the First Estate Church of White Plains. And look forward to a spiritual Sabbath. May God bless you. Welcome. Amen. And thank you, Sister Housen. We also have visiting with us Rhoda uh, and Davion Ali, visiting from Trinidad and Tobago. Amen. Would you please wave where you are? Uh, please see me after service. We have something for you as well. And also Althea and Perry Phillip from Antigua and Reverend George and Elsie Nixon. Would you wave your hand if I called your name? Amen. Uh, please see me after service. We have something for you since you have traveled from afar to see us. Uh, but we also have some fellowship for you at this time. Amen. And so just sit where you are, our visitors, and the members will come around as we embrace one another this Sabbath. We will show you a special White Plains welcome on this, on this beautiful weekend, this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you. glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord take. Let the glory of the Lord Let the praises of my 
I know the Lord has been good to you. He, he asked me to tell you, remain faithful in returning faithful tithe and offering. At this time, uh, I'm going to call the officers forward, the deacons and the ushers, and before we uh, collect the offering, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the hedge that you have put around about us. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. As we return a faithful tithe and offering, we ask you to bless these offerings. Let it go forward to finish your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are ways that we want to give our return our tithe and offering. I know inflation is rampant. That means uh, everything costs more money. But don't we realize that the Lord is faithful? The Lord says, be faithful to him, and he will be faithful for us. The Lord has put a hedge around about our families, and we thank him for all the blessings that he has given us. There are ways that we can give. We can return through Zelle. We can uh, return through the QR code in our uh, pews. Uh, we can return through uh, just sending a check to the First White Plains Seventh-day Adventist Church. Also, uh, you can just drop off your cash. If you need to pick it up, we will pick it up for you. We ask you to remain faithful, and as we uh, be uh, faithful stewards, God will be faithful to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. for blessing us during this stewardship segment. Today is Stewardship Day, friends and family. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, just very briefly, uh, we want to uh, support in prayer Elder Al Varanga, the president of the Personal Ministries Association for the Northeastern Conference. Uh, he is engaged in a very important program at Camp Victory Lake. Some of us are there supporting. So we wanna pray for the safe return of our members. And we also want to continue to pray for Elder and Sister Alvaranga as they lead this Personal Ministries Association. Uh, please uh, note that next Sabbath, everyone, is 
Sabbath School Rally Day. Amen? Amen. We will have with us Pastor Eastern Marks, the Sabbath School Coordinator of the Northeastern Conference who will be here. Uh, that the following Sabbath, rather, will be our Senior Ministries Day, amen, where we will celebrate the seniors who are in the house and for various reasons may not be in the house, but certainly many of them, they support uh, our church not only uh, with their uh, stewardship faithfulness, but also they watch online on Sabbaths, amen? So we want to celebrate them on the 23rd of September, and I will be the speaker for our Senior Ministries Day. I'm looking forward to that. I know uh, some of us may have remarked that it's been a while since I've been behind this sacred desk, uh, but during Senior Ministries Day, um, I will preach a word, um, hopefully, that will bless uh, those who are most deserving among us, um, our, our seniors. I want you to know that this afternoon as well, we will have a, a program geared towards stewardship. Um, this afternoon after uh, we have eaten, uh, Pastor Trevor Barnes will lead us in that discussion. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, this time around, I don't want to wait for the beginning of the year to get things right with God. Amen. Um, um, as we enter the final quarter of this year, um, I want to end right so that I can start right. Amen. And so um, I, I've noticed, I don't know if you have, but I've noticed that um, the better I am as a steward of my time and my resources, the less stress I have. Amen. The better I sleep at night, the better my health is, the, uh, uh, the more I get to cut down on stress. And so Pastor Barnes will share with us not only during uh, his sermon hour, but also this afternoon during our, uh, our uh, AY time, Pastor Barnes will share with us key principles of stewardship. Now, before our praise and worship team blesses us today, I want to introduce to you this mighty man of God. Pastor Trevor Barnes was raised in Oakland, California. And at the age of 17, he felt the call of God on his life. This call led him to Oakwood, now University in Huntsville, Alabama, where he completed his Bachelor's of Arts degree in theology. He then moved to Barron Springs, Michigan, where he completed his Master's of Divinity degree at the Andrews University Theological Seminary. Throughout the course of his ministry, Pastor Barnes has served as the youth pastor of the Fresno Westside SDA Church, the associate pastor of the Sacramento Capital City Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the Appian Way Seventh-day Adventist Church in El Sobrante, California and the North Side Seventh-day Adventist Church. He is passionate about evangelism. He has led his congregations uh, uh, through forums where they were, they were taught to do various outreach programs in the community. Uh, but he wants us to know that one of the most important, if not the most important after his relationship with Jesus, uh, thing in his life or a factor in his life is that he is married to the love of his life. Amen. Uh, Sister Jasmine, who could not be here with us today, uh, together they have two sons, Nia and Vivica Barnes and Trevor Douglas Barnes III. Trevor's motto is Philippians 3, verse 13 through 14, which reads, Brothers, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press forward towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Friends and family, today we will press forward together. We will look forward together. Whatever is behind us is behind us. And God has called us to be faithful stewards as he is faithful to us. And Pastor Barnes will lead us 
today into principles to help guide us into faithful stewardship that will help cut down the stress, cut down the anxiety, cut down the, the issues and troubles in our lives. After our praise and worship segment has happened, after we have praised and worshiped together, the next voice we will hear will be that of the Lord's manservant, my good friend and brother. This man and I, we go a ways back. Pastor Trevor Barnes, I'm sure he'll have stories, so I won't share any now, uh, but the Lord will certainly bless us through this man of God. At this time, let us praise together. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. There is no name. There's a name that's above all names. What name is that? Come on, what name is that? Come on, what name is that? The demons tremble when they hear of his name, Jesus. Mountains move when we call on his name. People are healed when we call on his name. What is his name? All right, we love to call his name because we know things happen when we call his name. Explain that happens when we proclaim. 
Jesus today? Can you put your hands together and just give God all the glory? All the honor and all the praise. In the name of Jesus. You know, I, I was thinking about the words of the song as the praise team was singing. The amazing thing about the words of that song is that it's saying that Jesus is so powerful that he actually doesn't even need to show up. <laughs> Think about that. All you just need to do is say the name of Jesus. H hadn't even got there and you've already got the victory. I, I don't know about you, but when I was thinking about that, uh, uh, some of y'all might be a little more saved and sanctified by me but, 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 than me, but my mind went back to the Lion King. And in the Lion King, there is a scene where uh, they just begin to say the name. I see some, uh, some of y'all getting there, yeah? Yeah, yeah, they begin to say the name Mufasa. <laughs> and, and when they said Mufasa, right, uh, that the, the, the hyenas begin to just tremble <laughs> at the name of Mufasa. That just made me think, Pastor Gary, hey, that, 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 that if hyenas would tremble at the name Mufasa, that demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Jesus, that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord. Do you believe that today at White Plains? Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. I do want to just thank the praise team for their ministry. Thank you all so much. Um, if you all don't know, you all are blessed. Sometimes we don't know what we have until it's gone. Uh, so I just want to say as someone who's from the outside, you all need to appreciate. Let's just put our hands together and just thank them for their ministry. I uh, appreciate them. Uh, elder who was next to me just said they prepared the way and they did. I believe that the ministry of music uh, pre prepares the way for the ministry of the word. And uh, I believe that that has been done uh, with a level of excellence today um, that I appreciate. Uh, I also want to just uh, thank uh, you all at White Plains for your kind welcome. Uh, I've never been in a church where I have got uh, a gift prior to the sermon, amen? <laughs> and so I just want to thank you all for your kindness uh, and to uh, Pastor Gurrier, my brother from another mother. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We go all the way back to Andrews University uh, where I met him uh, as a struggling seminarian. Uh, in our Hebrew class uh, with Dr. Brazier. And uh, uh, I, uh, I learned to call on that name in that class. Somebody else say amen. Just trying to get through Hebrews, Hebrew. And uh, uh, I just praise God for his friendship. Um, I have seen him uh, progress throughout the years. He was in my wedding, best man in my wedding. And I uh, just want to uh, thank him for his friendship. I have uh, just seen him grow throughout the years. And uh, I'm just praying that God continues to bless you in your ministry. Uh, he was in my wedding. I'm still working. Uh, <laughs> Some of y'all got that. Uh, but uh, one, one of these days, one of these great good night ones, uh, we will be in the wedding for Reg. He's the last one in our, our group that we are still praying over. Uh, but we know that the Lord works in mysterious ways. Amen. And I just uh, want to also, when I went into his office, I saw that White Plains has had over 100 years of ministry. And I just want to give God glory. I think we should give God glory for that. That's 100 years plus of ministry at this church. Um, I also just want to give a shout out. Let me see if I have any family here. I know that some are on their way. If I do have some family here, just want to ask. Hey, good to see you. Just want to ask if you just stand. Just stand uh, right where you are. Just so thank Praise God. Glory be to God. Let's just put our hands together uh, for them. Praise God. Glory be to God. 
Uh, I want to give a shout out also to my family that is watching online. I know that my wife Jasmine and my two children just want to make a little correction because I know my daughter uh, would get on me and that is I don't have two sons. I have a daughter Nia and then my son Trevor the uh, third who is back in St. Louis, Missouri. Are you ready to go to work today? If you are, I just want to invite you to stand. That is my tradition uh, at my church, and I just want to invite you to stand in honor of reading God's word. And go with me to the book of Luke. What book did I say? We are going to go to the 19th chapter. And when you get there, if you would be so kind as to say amen. Luke, the 19th chapter. I'm just going to go ahead and say this ahead of time. Uh, I am a preacher, but I'm also a teacher. And as a teacher, I believe that it is critical for uh, those who are in the class to, uh, to understand what I'm saying. And there's only one way that I know that you're understanding what I'm saying, and that is when you talk back to me, amen. And so this is not a monologue, this is a dialogue, and we will get through this a whole lot quicker uh, if you talk back to me today. Is that all right? Oh, y'all didn't sound like y'all say amen in this place. Is that all right? Yeah, all right, there we go. All right, we are uh, in Luke, the 19th chapter, and beginning in verse 1, the word of God says to us, then Jesus entered and passed through where? Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of a short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, I have given half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. For the next few moments, I'd like to speak to you on the subject that I have entitled, You've Got to Be Desperate. I like to do this in my church. If you don't mind, if you would just turn to your neighbor and just tell your neighbor, neighbor, oh neighbor, You've got to be desperate. Why don't you just turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, you've got to be desperate. You may be seated in the presence of God today.
Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, not another second, not another minute, not another hour, not even another day. But in this moment, Father, with my arms outstretched to you, I need you and I need you right away to make your word clear, to speak to our hearts. Father, give us a word from you, a word that is not from man, but a word that is from God. Touch our hearts, speak to us, and Father, we do pray that Jesus Christ would be only seen. Let him be lifted up, and as Jesus is lifted, I pray that all men and women, boys and girls, will be drawn closer to him. This is our earnest prayer today in the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ let all the saints of God say amen and amen just want to acknowledge that some more family uh, came in and it's good to see you all today if you've ever been to Sabbath school, then there are some Bible stories that you've heard. Stories like David defeating Goliath, Samson wielding the jawbone of a donkey, Noah building an ark, Daniel in the lion's den, the three Hebrew, Hebrew boys in a fiery furnace, and Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is so popular that a song was written about it, and perhaps you've heard it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Y'all know the song. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. Well, my brothers and sisters, while you may be familiar with the story and the song, I believe that there are lessons that we can learn from the life of Zacchaeus that I believe that we need to explore today. We encounter Zacchaeus as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. In just a few hours, Jesus will enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Palm branches will be laid on the ground and waved in the air as multitudes shout, Hosanna to God in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus' popularity is at its zenith because he recently raised Lazarus after he was in the grave for three days. And as the crowd approaches Jericho, Jesus performs another miracle. He heals a man by the name of blind Bartimaeus. And now the excitement of the crowd reaches a fever pitch. Everyone is excited about Jesus. Everyone is shouting about Jesus. Everyone except Zacchaeus. Because Zacchaeus is anxious. We wouldn't think that someone of his class and status would be anxious. After all, Zacchaeus is a man of great means. The Bible says he was rich. He is the chief tax collector in Jericho, and Zacchaeus has reached the top of his profession. The grit, grind, ingenuity, diligence, and hustle, he has climbed his way to the number one spot. He has shaken the right hands, rubbed the right backs, put in the right time, and he now is not just a tax collector, he's the chief tax collector. 
What this means is that he gets a cut of what the other tax collectors collect. In other words, he has strategically set up multiple revenue streams to ensure a continual flow of money into his bank account. He's not set up just to have money. He's now set up to have generational wealth. Can you see him in his Bugatti, <laughs> his Maserati, and, and his Ferrari as he drives around town? I, I, I can imagine that Zacchaeus lives on the highest hill in the most exclusive part of town. He dines in the finest restaurant. He wears the latest fashions. He's connected with the rich, the powerful, and the famous. Yet, for all his wealth and power, Zacchaeus has no peace. And not only that, Zacchaeus is empty. Zacchaeus has all the money that you could ever dream of, yet he is still looking for something else. I was listening to an interview of Gilbert Arenas and former NBA star, and he, he said something that I will never forget. He said, I had over a hundred million dollars in the bank, and yet I was still empty. For some of us, this is hard to believe because we have been taught a lie from the doctrine of capitalism that says that the more we get, the happier we'll be. But you can have it all and still be empty. If you don't believe me, then consider Anthony Bourdain, a TV star traveling over 250 days a year on quest in distant lands. He ate the finest foods in the best restaurants that the world could offer, and yet he committed suicide because he was empty. When Houston had one of the greatest voices that I've ever heard. She lived in a large Beverly Hills mansion. She had fame and fortune, but the coroner reports that she died of a cocaine overdose because she was empty. Don Cornelius, the uh, legendary host of Soul Train, come on y'all. He, he rubbed shoulders with legendary musicians like James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson, but he died a tragic death at his own hands because he had it all, yet he was empty. I want you to know today that money can't purchase you contentment. Power can't grant you peace. Houses don't guarantee happiness. And sex can't guarantee you love. And clothes can't guarantee companionship. You can have all the money in the world and still feel empty because money cannot satisfy. There's a friend of mine who took his wife, Pastor Gurrier, to a five-star restaurant back in Oakland, California to celebrate his wife's birthday. This restaurant had a world-class chef with the best food in town. They got dressed up to go to this fancy restaurant. They made their appo appointment and uh, they began to notice the menu. The menu uh, was uh, uh, of this restaurant uh, uh, signified the affluence and the status of the restaurant because there was nothing on the menu that was in English. Everything on the menu was in Italian. Now at this restaurant, they didn't have a uh, one course meal. They didn't have a two course or three course meal. They had a five course meal. And the food they told me was so good that it made their taste buds pop. But there was only one problem with the food. Uh, the, the, the food tasted good, uh, but the portions were tiny. Are y'all not with me today? So, so, so they ate five courses, and after they ate five courses, my friend tells me that he and his wife found themselves at Taco Bell. Why? Because they were still empty. And what I'm trying to tell you today is, my brothers and sisters, that what this world has to offer is just like that five course meal. You can eat it all. You can have it all. But guess what? It'll leave you 
empty. My brothers and sisters today, I want to suggest to you today that money, power, popularity, home, sex, technology, business ventures, education will leave you empty because we've got a hole in our soul and the only one who can satisfy that is Jesus. That's why the songwriter wrote that all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000. In this blessed Lord, I see I'm wondering today, are there some folk at White Plains who know that all that can fill the soul is Jesus? Because nothing else can satisfy. This is what Zacchaeus is feeling. He's empty. He's desperately searching for something more. But the good news about Zacchaeus is that he recognized that he needed Jesus. In fact, Zacchaeus is desperate to see Jesus. And Pastor Gurrier, we know that Zacchaeus is desperate to see Jesus from a few indicators in the story. First, the language that Luke uses indicates that Zacchaeus longed to see Jesus. The Greek word for see is zetel. This is a verb that means to, to look or desire. And this is in the imperfect tense, meaning that the action is not complete. In other words, inside of Zacchaeus, there is a restlessness that cannot be contained. He's looking and he's looking and he's longing to see Jesus. This is the same word that is used to describe the incident when Mary and Joseph are seeking for Jesus when he was lost for three days. In other words, the same intensity that a parent searches for a lost child with is the same intensity that is in the heart of Zacchaeus. He longs to see Jesus. He's desperate to see Jesus. And I'm wondering if there are some folk today who are in the same place as Zacchaeus are you desperate to see Jesus today but that's not the only indicator notice what Zacchaeus does he's so eager to see Jesus watch this that he runs and climbs up a tree now this may not seem like a big deal to us today Men run all the time, but at this time, men don't run. By the way, that's why it's a scandal in the story of the prodigal son when the father runs to the son, because at this time, men don't run. But Zacchaeus runs uh, to climb up a tree, a rich powerful, highfalutin, upper class, creme de la creme men don't run, but Zacchaeus runs and, 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 and he climbs up a sycamore tree. Can you see him as he pulls up his fine robes and scoots himself up a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see? And Zacchaeus does this because Zacchaeus has reached a point where he does not care what society says. He does not care what people think about him. He's just desperate to see Jesus. I want to submit to us today that this may reveal to us one of the reasons why there are some people who have not seen Jesus yet. See, uh, you've got to be desperate to see Jesus. I, I don't know about White Plains, but there are uh, some Christians who are just too concerned about what people may say. They're too concerned about what people may think. That they're, they're too concerned about the reputation that they've got to uphold. They, 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 they've got to make sure that they act dignified and, and in such a way that uh, presents themselves in a certain way. And I want you to know that sometimes that can get in the way of a seeing Jesus. We can be too worried about what people will say to praise him. 
We, we may wonder what they'll think if I stand up for the appeal. Uh, uh, we, we're too worried wondering about what they'll say if I get baptized or if I get rebaptized. We're too worried about everyone and what they are thinking. And I've just come by here to submit to you today that, that we haven't reached our point of desperation. And I want to submit to you today that sometimes God has to allow us to get desperate so that he can get our attention because God knows that some of us, the only time that we'll ever tune our ear to Jesus it's when we get desperate. When I was younger, I used to get bothered by the story of the blind man in scripture. Y'all know that story of the blind man when Jesus heals the blind man? That, that story used to bother me, Pastor Gurry. Hey, I, I, I was bothered by that story because Jesus heals the blind man in a way that just rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, 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 and I would be today. <laughs> you see, I, I, I want to remind you that when Jesus heals the blind man, he doesn't just speak the word and say, blind man, you're healed. But what Jesus does is Jesus begins to hawk a little bit. You can call it what you want, he hawked. <laughs> Jesus begins to hawk. And, and notice this, the, the man is blind but he can hear. And he's hearing Jesus. And then he can hear Jesus spit on the ground. And, and, and the Bible tells us that he spits uh, and then he mixes it into a clay mixture. Now, let me tell you something. There's got to be a whole lot of spit. Come on, y'all. There's got to be a whole lot of spit to make that thing into mud. And Jesus takes that and he puts it on the blind man's eyes. And then he tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I used to read that story and I would say to myself, hey, 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 look, there ain't no way in heaven, come on y'all, that I would ever have somebody to spit on the ground, make a mixture of mud, and then put that mixture on my face until I got desperate. You see, when you are blind and you want to see, you're willing to do anything to be healed. You see, when I went through some things in my life, when I had a financial crisis in my life and I got desperate, I was willing to ask Jesus to do anything. When I moved back to the Bay Area and we could not find a place to live and I got desperate, I was willing to ask God to do anything when my children were sick and I didn't know what to do because I could not heal their body. I got desperate. Are there some folk today that know uh, when you get desperate, uh, you're willing uh, to ask God uh, to do anything because you want to be healed. Zacchaeus is desperate. He don't care that they see him running. He doesn't care that they see him climbing up a tree. But yet there is an irony in the story. The irony is that Zacchaeus is not the only one who's desperate. Woo, y'all not with me today. You see, in the story, we've got to understand that the same desperation that Zacchaeus has to see Jesus is the same desperation that Jesus has to see Zacchaeus. Oh my goodness. Uh, Jesus is desperate to see Zacchaeus. Can you see the scene? The crowd is surrounding around Jesus. Everyone wants his attention, but Jesus is not looking to the left 
or to the right at the multitude. Jesus is walking down and the Bible tells us that he's looking up at the trees. He's not paying attention to the multitude around him because Jesus is looking for one person. He's desperate to see Zacchaeus. And Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, is so excited to see Zacchaeus that when he sees Zacchaeus, there's a multitude around him. They're following him. They're pressing him. But the Bible says that Jesus stops. Oh, yeah, now we mean it. In other words, Jesus is telling the multitude, you've got to wait because I'm here to see my boy. Zacchaeus, can you see the smile rise on Jesus' face? Can you see the, 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 the teeth uh, glaring? Can you see the white in his eyes? Because Jesus is finally able to see his boy. I, I want you to know today that just as Jesus is excited and anxious and desperate to see Zacchaeus, I want you to know in the same way Jesus is desperate to see you. Guess what? That's not the only indicator that Jesus is desperate. Because if you keep looking the story, you'll discover that, that, that Jesus does something else that reveals his excitement. Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today are y'all not getting that thing Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus and he says to him Zacchaeus I'm going to your house today I'm gonna get it one more time Zacchaeus I'm going to your house today I hope y'all got it who invites themselves To somebody's house. And look, uh, polite society says that you must wait to be invited to somebody's house. Uh, some of us have even developed techniques to help people get the hint that we want to go over the house. Uh, some of us uh, have learned to develop that face, that uh, hungry face that makes it look like we want to come over to somebody's house. Some of us know how to ask the question. Um, so are you having uh, dinner at your house today? You know? Because we know that polite society does not invite themselves over. Uh, people, no one acts to go over someone's home except children. I got two kids <laughs> and, and I've had it happen time and time again where after church I, I, I'm, I'm talking and then my kids' friends will come up to me and they'll say, hey, Pastor Barnes, Pastor Barnes, can we go to your house today? Because we want to play with TJ and Nia. Can we go to your house today? Because kids have not learned the rules of polite society. Kids don't know uh, uh, what the boundaries are that we have set up in society. In other words, the Bible is telling us that God in the flesh is acting just like a child. I know that bothers some of us because we can't imagine God acting like a child. We see God as the strict, strident businessman who runs the affairs of the universe with no ex emotion except displeasure. But perhaps we've got it all wrong. Perhaps the reason why Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God is because in some ways God is like a child who gets so excited that he can't hold his joy inside. His joy bubbles up and overflows. Why? Because God wants to hang out with you and with me.
I want you to know today that God can hardly contain his excitement about you because he is anticipating spending eternity on you. I want you to know that God has always had you on his mind from eternity past. God has longed to be with you. Sin has separated us from God, but Jesus loves us so much that he didn't care about the proper protocols of his day. He wanted to to be with us. God breaks all the protocols to hang out with us. Do you know that a protocol is seen in the book of Daniel? When Nebuchadnezzar is talking to the wise men um, and, and they are asking him to tell them the dream uh, and, and they, they say, hey, tell us the dream and then we'll tell you the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar is like, no, 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 I, I want you to tell me what I dream. The wise men say something that is a protocol. They said, hey, what the king asks is impossible because uh, 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 that can only be done by God who does not dwell with flesh. Oh, y'all not with me today. Uh, in other words, uh, they're saying that God doesn't come out and hang out with people. God doesn't come out and spend time with his creation. But I want you to know that the good news of the gospel is that God desires uh, to hang out with you and me. That God loved us so much that he broke the protocol. The Bible tells us that God took upon himself the seed of Abraham. The Bible tells us in Isaiah that a virgin will conceive and give birth a son and they will call his name Emmanuel which means that God is with us because God broke all the protocols in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the very beginning with God. All things were made by him and there was nothing made that was uh, made by him that was not made. In him was life and this life was the light of men. Then in verse 14 it says this same word which made the worlds. My brothers and sisters, he dwelt amongst us. Emmanuel dwelt with us because God desires to hang out with you and I. And he breaks whatever protocol that would separate us from him. And I don't know about you today, but I just thank God that Jesus was willing to break the protocol between God and man because he loved us so much that he wanted to hang out with us. But I want you to know that dwelling with humanity is not the only protocol that Jesus broke. The Bible tells us that Zacchaeus climbed a tree, but I want you to know today that Jesus also climbed a tree. Ah, my Bible tells me that one Friday he climbed up a tree on Gotha's holy hill to save you and me. He was nailed to a tree. He was cursed on a tree. He hung naked on a tree. He became sin on a tree. He was reviled and rejected on a tree. He was mocked on a tree and he died on a tree uh, to save you and me. Uh, but I want you to know that that's not the end of the story because my Bible tells me that three days later that Jesus got up out the grave uh, early Sunday morning. He got up because he broke the protocol. An angel rolled away the stone and he walked out the tomb because Jesus broke the protocol to release eternal life for you and for me. Now, my brothers and sisters, I need to make a quick turn because I wish that the rest of the story was that Jesus came to visit Zacchaeus and life was happy every after. But unfortunately, this is not what happened. Because the people began to complain that Jesus was hanging out with a sinner. 
Truth be told, in my mind, I would imagine that everyone in Jericho would rejoice that Jesus was hanging out with the sinner because if Jesus is willing to hang out with a sinner like Zacchaeus, he's willing to hang out with anyone, but the crowd isn't happy. The crowd begins to grumble. The crowd begins to complain that Jesus is hanging out with sinners. My brothers and sisters, unfortunately, this reminds us that the crowd around Jesus doesn't always act like Jesus. The crowd around Jesus can be judgmental. The crowd around Jesus can be mean-spirited. The crowd around Jesus can be fault-finding. The crowd around Jesus can be graceless and cantankerous. Uh, 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 they uh, originally got in the way of Zacchaeus getting to Jesus, and now they're trying to separate Zacchaeus from Jesus. Now I've come to discover, Pastor Gurrier, that it's a dangerous thing when the saints get to know your sin because they get a false sense of moral superiority. They begin to think that they're better than you. But I've got some news for the church today. So what if you know somebody's dirt? Knowing the faults of others doesn't make you better than anyone else because you've got dirt in your own closet. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all gone astray. We've all turned aside. We all need a savior. The problem is that we like to compare ourselves with each other. We like to compare ourselves with our neighbor. But I got some news for you today. Your neighbor is not your standard. Because Jesus is the ultimate standard. And when we look at him, we all discover that we all fall short and we are all in need of the grace of God. Do you believe that today? But the crowd's reaction also reveals something else. The crowd around Jesus isn't in harmony with the mission of Jesus. Oh, it's a terrible thing when the saints aren't in harmony with the mission of Jesus. You see, uh, the saints around Jesus believe that it's their mission to purify the church. That, 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 that's what they're saying. Jesus is around sinners. In other words, sinners aren't supposed to be around Jesus. Have you ever met somebody who believes that it's their spiritual duty to straighten up everybody in the church? They feel that it's their job to cleanse the church of sin. And the problem with this is that that's not our mission. Let me give you a little Bible. Because Malachi says, and he shall purify. Y'all not with me today. Uh, Y'all not with me today. I, I, I want you to know, let me give you a little Bible. Malachi says, and he shall purify. Uh, in other words, and God is the one who will purify the church. In other words, it's not our job to purify the church. That's God's job. We aren't called to clean the fish. We're called to catch the fish. We aren't called to separate the wheat from the tares. God will separate the wheat from the tares, lest we mess it up. And this is why Jesus reminds the crowd at this time of his mission. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. In other words, if you're going to be about following me, you've got to be about saving sinners, not condemning sinners. You've got to be about rescuing people, not rejecting people. As disciples of Jesus, we're called to go to the highways and byways and compel people to come to Jesus. We've got to lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring to let the whole world know that Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that today? But another issue with the crowd is that they assume that they are sons of Abraham. Now, the term son of Abraham is an ancient way of saying that you're saved. 
The crowd thinks that they are saved because they are sons and daughters of Abraham. And, and they label Zacchaeus as a sinner who could never be a son of Abraham. But here's what's strange. Uh, the, the Jews actually have good reason to think that they are children of Abraham. After all, they are biological descendants of Abraham. In other words, they can trace their genetic roots to Abraham. But, but get what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that a genetic link to Abraham is not enough. Because a true child of Abraham is not one who's born once, uh, but a true child of Abraham is somebody who's been born twice. Because if you're going to get into the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. John the Baptist said it this way. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children to Abraham. In other words, you think that you are children of Abraham because you're genetically related to Abraham, but your heritage means nothing because you must demonstrate the proper fruits of repentance to be children of Abraham. I believe that the same thing applies to us today. You see, my brothers and sisters, there is no safety in being a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation Adventist. There is no safety in saying uh, that I can trace my uh, lineage back in the church all of these years. I want you to know that what makes you a child of God is not your heritage in the church. It's not your 100 years of being here at White Plains in your family legacy. What makes you a real child of God is when you show the fruit of repentance. In other words, are we loving are we forgiving? Are we gentle? Are we kind? Are we generous? Do we practice self-control? If we don't have the fruit, we can claim we've got the Holy Ghost in our lives, but the fruit demonstrates if we've got him or not. So we can press a profess whatever we want, but in judgment day or on judgment day, God will say, I never knew you. And that's why the words of Zacchaeus are so important. Because while the crowd condemns Zacchaeus, notice his response. Zacchaeus says, Jesus, what I've stolen I'm willing to restore fourfold. Oh, y'all. Oh, I, I, I'm willing to give back everything four times over. And we've got to understand that there is significance to this because in, in the Deuteronomic law, the penalty was a thief of a thief was that they had to restore fourfold what they sold so this is Zacchaeus confessing my brothers and sisters in other words Zacchaeus is saying yes I'm a thief yes I've broken God's law yes I've cheated yes I've lied yes I've coveted yes I've stolen he's saying Jesus I'm a sinner that is in need of grace and notice what happens when Zacchaeus comes out and confesses his sin to Jesus. Immediately, I can imagine that Jesus stands up in the middle of the crowd and he looks at everybody in the eye and he says to them, this man too is a son of Abraham. In other words, when Zacchaeus confessed, God did not reject him, but God accepted him. And I'm simply trying to tell you today that if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and still just to forgive us 
of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. Why? Because the Son of Man did not come into this world to condemn us, but to save us. Just like that prodigal son who came home expecting his father to condemn him when he got home, but, but instead he found a loving father with open arms ready to receive him and celebrate him is the same way that our God is ready to receive you and I today. But there's one more part in Zacchaeus' statement. Zacchaeus says this, Jesus, I give half of my goods to the poor. Oh, y'all not with me today. Zacchaeus is willing to give his wealth to the poor. He, he, he's willing to give his wealth to pan handlers. And, and, and people who are sleeping on street corners, people who didn't grind like he did to make it all the way to the top, Zacchaeus is willing to give to people who are homeless. Uh, Zacchaeus is willing to give to people who hold up signs that, 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 that say, help me with some food, while they're begging on the street corners. The truth of the matter is that this bothers us. It offends us because we think that they should get out there and hustle like we did to make it where we are. But could this be an excuse for our selfishness? You see, our willingness to give to the undeserving denotes that we are like God. Because God gives to those who don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be alive today. We don't deserve to have another beat of our heart because we're all sinners in need of the penalty of sin, which is death. But I want you to know today that even though we deserve to die, God graciously gives us breath in our lungs. He gives us what we do not deserve. Do you know that every good and precious gift comes from God? My brothers and sisters today, uh, if we aren't willing to give to those that we feel don't deserve it it, it, it demonstrates how far from God we really are. My brothers and sisters, Zacchaeus' actions show a change. There's a change of heart. He loves people more than things. He doesn't idolize money. He, uh, he, he, he used to idolize money, but he idolizes money no more. He used to be greedy, but now he's a giver. He used to be selfish, but now he's selfless. He used to steal from the poor, but now he gives to the poor. And Zacchaeus giving demonstrates that God's grace can change the heart because salvation is demonstrated by our stewardship. Stewardship reveals where our heart really is. And this is why Jesus says that our eternal destiny is tied to our stewardship because Jesus says where your treasure is that's where your heart is also. So my brothers and sisters, what does your giving say about you? Where do you and I have our treasure? Fashion, cars, clothes, cribs, food, education, travel, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with any of these things in themselves, but what is wrong when we put
put these things before God. Uh, what's wrong is when we see the least of these and we close our hands to them because we don't care about them. That's the problem. You see, when the Spirit of God has touched your heart, you are willing to minister to the least, uh, the lost, uh, and those who are in need of help because you've got the Spirit of God in your heart. My brothers and sisters, do we invest our resources into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of self? I don't care what we profess today. Our habits prove our priorities. Our bank statements prove whether we profess to live for God or if we deny God. And that's the honest truth today. I know I won't be back at White Plains after this. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, I want to show you one more thing as I go to my seat. Watch this. I know. I know that we can be bothered by what Zacchaeus does and the truth that's revealed in this text. But I want you to remember something. Originally, before Zacchaeus met Jesus, he was anxious, he was nervous, he was longing for something more. But after he met Jesus, and after he gave his wealth away, the Bible says he gave half of his wealth to the poor. After he gave half his wealth away, the Bible says that Zacchaeus left the presence of Jesus completely different. The Bible tells us he left Jesus' presence with joy. My brothers and sisters, perhaps... This is why God wants us to be good stewards. Maybe it's not because uh, uh, it's that he doesn't want us to be happy. Maybe it's because he understands what will really give us ultimate happiness. And that is that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And my brothers and sisters, Zacchaeus shows us that the theology that's taught in our world that the more you get, the happier you'll be. It's absolutely wrong. The one who is the happiest is the one who receives Jesus in their life. And the one who decides to use their resources for the kingdom of God. My brothers and sisters, that is what will give you real joy joy that the world didn't give and joy that the world can't take away yesterday we were at pastor Amasil at what, what church were we at Hebron as we were leaving Hebron he told us a story in the car he told us a story of a uh, uh, a, a, a young lady who came over into the country and, and she had a, a daughter with a, a ailment. She uh, had eyes that could not open and Pastor Amasil and the church began to minister to this young lady. They found her a place to stay. They got her a job and they, they helped her uh, to raise the funds to be able to uh, repair her daughter's eyes and, 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 and they could just see the joy that was on her face when uh, her daughter began to see for the first time there was joy in their hearts but 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 not only did uh, she have joy at the fact that she was able to get a job and to find a place to stay but pastor Amasil and the rest of the church had joy in their hearts because there's joy when you take care of the children of God there's joy when we're willing to give my brothers and sisters God understands what will give us the greatest happiness the greatest happiness is not in trying to get more our greatest happiness is in trying to give more with every head bow with every eye close 
today I know there's someone who's saying in their heart you know what God I hear your word today I know that I have not been a good steward of the resources that you've given me nothing else proves where our heart is or where our mouth is professing whether we're real or fake like our stewardship so today I know that there's someone I'm not trying to embarrass you but I just want you to know that I want to pray for you right now somebody today is saying God I want to be more faithful as your steward and if that's you today I want you to know I'm praying for you right now Heavenly Father Lord in the name of Jesus these are your children and Father there is a wrestling that goes on particularly in our cities Lord there's a wrestling that goes on and this wrestling is who will we serve will we serve God or will we serve our money Father today right here at White Plains there are some individuals who are saying within their heart that right now I want to be a faithful steward on that day when you burst through the clouds we want to hear well done thou good and faithful servant you've been faithful over a few things I will make you ruler over many things and Heavenly Father today there are some who are saying within their hearts, Lord, help me to be faithful. Lord, if there are some things that I need to cut out my life so that I don't have unnecessary expenses so that I can be a better steward, Father, help me to sacrifice those things. Father, to be a, a, a better steward, Father, to take care, not to close my heart up to my brothers and sisters that are in need, but to have a sincere desire to help everyone that I can help on my Christian journey father I pray that you'd make that change inside of our hearts mold us shape us and have your way then father there's someone else today I dare not end our time together without giving somebody an opportunity to give their heart to Jesus Christ in this way there's somebody today who knows that you're desperate you know today that you are desperate you've been struggling you've been wrestling with giving your heart to Jesus and today God is calling you today is the acceptable time now is the acceptable hour and if there is an individual today who is simply saying you know what I've been wrestling for too long I've fallen on my face and I recognize today that just like Zacchaeus I need Jesus if that's you today I'm gonna encourage you to stand right where you are my brother and my sister right where you are just stand today giving your heart back to God now is your season now is your time to make sure that your life is right with God don't leave here today without making sure that your life is right with God I'm gonna only appeal for a few more moments but if that's you today won't you just stand right where you are Jesus is in your life don't worry about the crowd don't worry about what folk will say about you folk have no heaven or hell to put you in my brother my sister 
now is your time. Here's the last thing I'll say before I take my seat, I promise. Understand that it's not just us who are desperate. Understand that God is desperate for you. Understand, understand today that the happiness of your father is not fulfilled until you come home. Don't you want to make your daddy happy today? Stand for him. If that is your desire today, where are you, my brother? Where are you, my sister? Give your heart to him today. Heavenly Father, today, we just want to thank you for the opportunity of worshiping in this place. We want to thank you for the challenge of your word. Father, I believe you challenge us because you see what's best within us. And you want us to grow into the full stature of the measure of Jesus Christ. And I pray today, Father, that this would be a step on the journey of your disciples here at White Plains SDA Church. Father, I do pray in the name of Jesus that you would increase this pastor with favor, Lord. Put your hand over him as he leads and guides this congregation. Bless the rest of the members here. And our Father, I pray today that there would be a revival such as we have never seen even in the first outpouring of the rain the early rain may there be latter rain power in this place like we have never seen or experienced on this earth before through the power of Jesus Christ this is my prayer in the mighty name of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let everyone today say amen and amen. Amen, amen. Let's put our hands together one more time for Pastor Barnes and that rich, powerful message during our stewardship day. We want to let you know that we do have lunch downstairs for everyone, after which we will have our AY program at four, and then Pastor Barnes will share some words with us on financial management and stewardship. So if you're looking to make a huge financial decision, uh, we invite you to come and share with us right here in the sanctuary at 5 p.m. Or if you're just looking for for advice as to how to uh, better get your finances in order or how to become a better steward of your time and your resources. You do not want to miss the interactive afternoon program. Right now, I would like to uh, give a shout out, as Pastor Barnes would say, to Elder Phillips. Elder Phillips, would you stand, please? Elder Phillips is our stewardship director here at the White Plains Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was not feeling too well today, but he made it out to join us. We thank you for the ye your years of service here at our, as our stewardship leader and elder. And may God continue to bless you as you show and lead us how to be blessed by God. At this time, we invite you to stand for our closing hymn, after which we will have the benediction of the day. At the cross, 163 at the cross, where I first saw the light. Please turn your hymnals to 163. <laughs>
Father, we thank you for this joyful, inspirational, and teachable moments that we've had. We thank you for the messenger, God. And as we depart, I pray that we will keep these things in our heart and they will, we will continue to be transformed into who you would want us to be. Now grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and for all eternity. Amen. Please be seated as you're ushered out. We want to leave a song with you. Please remember the program this afternoon. It's starting at... 5 p.m. Please be there. I praise your name, your holy name. I praise your name.